growing old a marvelous thing. I mean, who wants to be a rosebud all your life? Only when the this flower is... I am so lucky. Virgil Thompson once said to me, I was 26 years old. John Houseman introduced us. And he looked at me and he said, What a beautiful woman you are going to be. No, it's not too late. You're not to say that. I love you more than anything in the world. Oh, please, Wax, and kiss me, please. No. It's no use. It's too late. Oh, we can't lose each other now. We must be together. I'm Jean Wolfe. In this program, I'll talk with Joan Fontaine, a legendary leading lady with a very independent view of her own life and career and the Hollywood system that made her a star. Anybody who knew that I was going to meet you only had one question, which is, why don't we see you more in films now? I just did a Canon show, a two-hour special, and it was seen in November. But to get uh, any good scripts at all is impossible. Really, it is. It's the only good script I've been offered for a long time, and even then, it's not the greatest script in the world. They say the roles for the glamorous women are it's getting almost extinct at this point anyhow and then you stayed too beautiful and glamorous for too long so you can't play grandmother role well, i don't want to either you know I, I think there's some place where you owe your audience that's been nice enough to like you and come to see you for many years many many years and write you and all that i owe them a, a debt not to do trash well, not to do trash, but certainly character roles, certainly something that's a... Well, if one were marvelous and it came along, but they're usually horrors, they're all kinds of maniacs and that kind of thing. I don't want to play that. I really don't feel I have to prove anything. If somebody has, has never maybe played a certain kind of part and they want a character part, fine. But I don't really feel that I need to. You know, it's it's kind of a shame, too, that the great actresses are making, what do they call them, ghoulies, horror movies yeah, that's now. Yeah, they were, anyway. But when you see something marvelous, like uh, Evelyn Le Gallion in New York, in the royal family, now she's only done fine work. And here she is in her 70s, comes out, and this she gets a standing ovation every single night. Why? First of all, she's a marvelous actress. Secondly, she has stood for quality, and she has never cheapened herself in any way. Your sister, Olivia de Havilland, did some of the horror movies. Did you yes. talk to her about it? Why? No, no, I didn't. You, you wonder why someone like, I guess they just want to keep... It was the Vogue at the time, and Betty Davis was doing them, and Joan Crawford was doing them, and they might have thought it was kind of a, an amusing thing to do, and another kind of, another facet, and I think... As we were just saying, maybe they wanted to prove that they could play all kinds of parts. Well, fine. Well, if we're going to talk, we have to get back to the subject of your sister, Olivia de Havilland, because, oh, I guess for so long, so much of the publicity about you and her had to do with the two of you feuding mm -hmm. um, up for the same parts. Of course, maybe the only time in history that two sisters were up for an Academy Award in the, in the same year. Is that yeah. feud still going on? Well, it, wasn't, it didn't happen there. I really think it happened when I was born. My sister being a little older than I was, um, we were born in the Orient and we had armors and all that sort of thing. I was a sick little child and I don't think Olivia was allowed in my nursery. And then I think she rebelled and wouldn't come in even. And the, it started there, that kind of, not we can't even say sibling rivalry yet. But uh, it was not helped. We are highly motivated and our parents and people around us uh, brought us up with a, a point of view of vying. You can, she can't kind of thing, contest. Uh, that makes for achievers. 
It's a marvelous thing that way, but it doesn't make for a particular close bond because we were rivals long before we thought of being actresses. It was the way we were brought up. And I'm sorry about it. I wish it hadn't been so. Did it bother you, too, that the press and the public seem oh, yeah. to take such a perverse glee in, you know, writing up everything? Oh, my dear, they don't print the nice things. My sister and I took my father's ashes to Guernsey, where he was brought up with my mother, and she and I sprinkled his ashes into the English Channel at sunset. Not one newspaper printed that. When she came to New York and I gave her a party, nobody printed that. No, I guess no, they only smiling faces, shaking hands, just don't they make good don't stories. That. No, they, they like the cute. I think what it is, is it justifies their own feelings. Because a lot of brothers and sisters or families don't get along. And they say, aha, you see, I'm not so bad because they don't get along. It's a personal thing with a lot of people. Oh, well, it's also just press agentry. Well, it's that, too. But we were, we are our rivals. There's no doubt about it. We always played the same kind of roles, and sometimes she'd get a role or I'd get a role. As a matter of fact, she's very nice to admit that I got her gone with the wind because I went in to read for it, and I was going to do Rebecca. And I said, what about my sister? And George Cukor said, who's that? I said, Olivia de Havilland. He said, well, I never thought of her. She got it the next day. But Olivia's very kind about that, and... So we have been uh, buying, not only uh, in the family, but in our careers as well. If you were brought up to be kind of competitive, were yes. you both also brought up to be actresses? I mean, it is a bit of an accident. It's interesting. Well, it isn't really. My mother was Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. She played the piano and sang beautifully. Since she's a Victorian lady, they weren't allowed to be on the stage. However, she could sing and she could play the piano. That was permitted. So when we first came to America from Japan, uh, mother was uh, concerned with our sloppy speech. And I remember sitting around the dining room table reciting Shakespeare when we could just read that far back and precisely. And we got our knuckles wrapped if we slurred or mispronounced. We did little restoration comedies, things like that. Now, whether my mother had a view to having her daughters fulfill her own ambition, I don't know. But we had a marvelous background for it. We had ballet lessons from the age of five and six. We had piano lessons. We had singing lessons, French lessons, all the things that actually turned into perfect equipment for us studies. We, on the other hand, had other kind of lessons. We had a kind of tutorial background where we had domestic sciences, and uh, I learned to cook uh, with a tutor by the time I was 10. I had made my own dresses, cooked complete meals. I even learned to garden and to graft trees. And when did you decide to put all of that together into your own ambition to be an actress? I think it was opportunity and fate. I mean, the, uh, uh, frankly, they didn't believe in college education for girls. That is a very English Victorian attitude, but they didn't. Olivia won a scholarship to Mills College. I went to Japan and had a year at the, Imper uh, the uh, American School in Tokyo. Got back to find Olivia had started in Midsummer Night's Dream. I was engaged. I went down to Hollywood to say goodbye to her. And the silly man said to me, I was reading poetry, which I adore, and he said, oh, put that book down. You're only a bit of fluff. <laughs> well, I tell you. <laughs> oh, that made me absolutely determined that he would eat those words. And um, off went the engagement ring and into an agent's office. I went, did two plays, then was seen by Jesse Lasky and signed on, uh, for movies. But it was... We had the equipment, but we had equipment for other but things. But I, well. I mean, I just saw a bit of a flash of what I've always, my picture of, of you has always been is very independent. I mean, when the other stars were being told you will do this film and you won't do this film, you were as independent as you are now about um, you have not... to be selective, it is. It's not, it's often called temperamental and being difficult. You have to use your mind with your career. You just can't do any old thing because you're told to do it. You must stand, look at, look at marvelous Catherine Hepburn. I mean, she stuck by her gun. She was called box office poison. Look at her now. 
She's on Broadway, God bless her, you know. And she has, in spite of all these stupid remarks about her being this or that, she's known exactly what was good for her, and she's done it. But, I mean, I just can't picture you fighting with David Selznick because you didn't like the fact that he got oh, a big fee. constantly. Oh, we, I went on suspension, and another thing that I admire so much about my sister, that Olivia went as far as the Supreme Court, and it is called the de Havilland decision. And she broke the seven-year contract where they could extend it forever and they could put you on suspension when you weren't paid. Olivia did that and, in a sense, ruined the whole studio star system because it couldn't survive without the peonage that we'd all been put through, where they could loan you out for half a million dollars and still be paying you nothing. That's what was going on. But in a, you, in a way, you're disillusioning us. We're supposed to be weeping for that old Hollywood system and all the glamour and glitter. It had many inequities. There's no doubt about it. It had some good things. I mean, it was a good thing that it uh, built stars. And if you had a bad picture, it would usually be arranged that you had a better one. So the bad picture wasn't a box office fiasco, as it were. Um, that's about all they did. They just gave you a sequence of, of jobs and sometimes well cast, sometimes simply cast for their own benefit. Not what was going to be good for you, unless you had, as Norma Shearer did, married to Thalberg, she had a protector, uh, Jennifer Jones married to David Selznick. That's different. But the single person, especially the woman, had to fight for her part, fight for her um, right to do it, fight for her salary. It was not easy to be a woman first and an actor. Those are two no-nos that are very difficult to withstand. I guess that it's part of this sort of nostalgia at this point in our society that we look back on Hollywood. I mean, in a way, our image of Hollywood in those days is almost a bigger fiction than any film they put out. Well, it's the star system you're talking about, and the star system was lovely. And it began, I would say, it is considered the time uh, between 1935 and 49, the glamorous years of Hollywood. That is when the star system was really going, and I think Olivia broke that um, seven-year contract just about there. And that's, then the studios had by this time, of course, started making pictures in Europe. Labor got far too expensive, and uh, labor in Europe is cheaper. Also, people had been away in the war and wanted to see the real thing. A studio backdrop was no longer uh, sufficient, and that is another reason for the decline of it. I think the greatest decline of both the theater and the movies, though there's some good work still, is the fact that we don't have the writers. Now, where the writers are, I don't know. I personally think that part of it is responsible because of television. When you put a little child in front of a television set, it no longer makes up its own games, it no longer goes in the corner and draws or does things with mechano sets. It doesn't um, create stories in its mind. Now, with that kind of manufactured entertainment, the writer, who is a man of imagination and creativity, uh, probably can't come out. Well, let's, let's talk about the moments when you did have the great writers and the great playwrights and the great directors. They were usually taken from novels. Rebecca, that's your thing. Yes, one. but Jane Eyre and uh, Even Island in the Sun, Constant Nymph, all these were books, you see. They were, and I'm um, thinking of those that Olivia did, Gone with the Wind, all these, Captain Blug, Anthony Adverse, all novels. Was, was Rebecca the one film, I mean, it's the one that you were so connected with I identified it but I knew it wasn't Rebecca it was all a lie I knew where Rebecca's body was lying on that cabin floor on the bottom of the sea how did you know Max because I put it there
strikes. It's too late. No, it's not too late. You're not to say that. I love you more than anything in the world. Oh, please, Max, and kiss me, please. No. It's no use. It's too late. Oh, we can't lose each other now. We must be together always. No secrets, no shadows. We only have a few days. Well, I'm very lucky. I've made about 45 films. Among those, I would say five or six are classics. That's a pretty good batting average. Rebecca Suspicion, Constant Nymph, Jane Eyre, a Letter from an Unknown Woman. Among those, are there also some that you blush at a little bit? Oh, sure. And I wouldn't have done them except that they just got you in such a corner that you had to do them or you were under contract and you just wanted to get rid of that contract and never see those people again. If I had to do it again, I would refuse to do those. I would say absolutely not. I would live a different way. I wouldn't be caught up. Well, when we you, all were with the Hollywood way of having to have a pool, a projection room, three or four cars, <laughs> uh, furs and jewels and the lame gone for the premiere. I'd be smarter than that. I would not do any of that, but they forced you to do it. They said, we have to photograph you in a suitable background. You must hire a yacht and we'll <laughs> photograph you for the weekend. This kind of thing was expected by the movie magazines and the public. And this did indeed create the glamorous years. But under that was a lot of people with no bank accounts. And a lot of people who are in the motion picture relief home right now. A lot of people who ended up in... Yes, in because the studios were very clever to coerce us to spend our money. Thereby, the, the seven-year contract had power. Because if you had no money in the bank, having spent it because they asked you to, and then you were suddenly off salary for nine months, you came to heal pretty rapidly. Joan Fontaine, you sound, you just sound too sensible about all of this. I mean, how do you stay so in balance when, all right, you say some of your friends are uh, out of bank accounts, so many of the people who you were starring with are, let's say, are dissipated on drugs, alcohol, whatever. I mean, they, they were consumed by their careers. They were eaten up by this ambition. I mean, how did you maintain kind of a balance about it all? Well, I owe everything to having marvelous parents. I had an artistic and uh, a mother with such, she was so fastidious, such a marvelously elegant, sensitive woman. And uh, my father, of course, was a scholar. And my stepfather was a very practical, intellectual realist at the same time. So I had three very fine influences in my life. But, I, I mean, I don't want to also paint a picture of you as having had a, you know, a perfectly smooth life. If you've had four marriages, you've had your share of uh, emotional ups and downs. Knowing what you do about modern society, if it were today, would those be marriages or would you have lived with those men? I would certainly have lived with them and not married them. But we had to marry. That was another uh, thing of the system. They had to photograph you. They could blackmail you. Anybody could uh, put it in the paper that you were immoral or something of that nature, you had to marry. And it's too bad, because uh, with those various pressures, you did not necessarily grow together. You may have grown in different strides, but possibly apart rather than together because of the enormous demands of, of both careers and, and well, both people. three of your husbands were in one way or another connected with show business and then mm -hmm. your fourth husband was... was uh, editor of Sports Illustrated. Was, was that easier to deal with, someone who wasn't no, in the business? because I didn't know. I don't know what I thought. But again, I should not have married him. I should have lived with him. Uh, I didn't realize that as a golf editor, that there are very few golf courses on Manhattan Island. <laughs> and that meant that he was away the whole time. And all I did when I got married to him was try to walk around the golf courses with the crowds, which was impossible, and that he would come in and have to write his articles that night and get up at 6 in the morning for the playoff or whatever it was, the cut. And then, um, so I gave that up, and I found I was staying home needle-pointing the ceilings. And that didn't work either. It was just no way. So it, it was a very difficult thing. And I think, frankly, that anybody who has creative talent, and I hope I have, has no right not to do it. 
No right and not to pursue yes, this. to simply be a wife and mother. Well, well, there's something about you, you know, you see that, oh, I don't know, that's always such a, a lady. I picture you getting up in the morning already dressed in a Chanel suit kind of thing. What about you, would you say, is old-fashioned, this sort of lady image, and what about you is modern? Oh, I don't know. I play golf, and I like to fish, and I go to all the mm, opera I can, all the shows I can see. I think uh, I write my own speeches. I lecture all over the country. Um, I, I don't see anything It's your, Then you're saying it's your independence. That's what? That's, a, that's the modern thing about you, that's sympathetic, say, to the liberated woman. I was a pretty independent kid, and so is my sister. We just don't knuckle down. If we believe something is right, it's right, and that's it. And at, at any cost, we both of us maintain what we believe in. So in a sense, you were liberated before everybody else was hollering well, about it. Well, just downright stubborn. I don't know which way you want to call it. <laughs> how, did, how did the lecturing come about? Was that one of your audience again? Well, I, uh, I do a great deal of reading. I was ill as a child, so I read copiously, and especially poetry. So they came to me and asked me to lecture. So I have five or six lectures, and one which I adored doing. I put together the letters and poems of Elizabeth and Robert Browning. So it makes a whole evening of reply and answer through every word is theirs. It, it took me a long time to read everything I could and interweave them. So it's two conversations going. It's very beautiful. And with the lecture that I like doing at this moment... Well, you're lecturing here at the Society for Arts in Palm Beach. What is that? Three centuries of America through the words of her women poets? Have I got it right? Yes, that's a, approximately it. And that's quite fascinating because last year was the International Women's Year. This year, of course, bicentennial. So I put the two together. And it's only about women poets who are seeing America in their own way. And so we don't go into women's talking about their souls or <laughs> their dead lovers or any of that. We just see the emergence of women uh, and their courage. Look, several of these women committed suicide, by the way. Many of them were activists. Many of them were reporters. Three of them wanted to be actresses. Two were. It's interesting to hear you so admiring of other women. I think that's important to know because when we associate you, we associate with you with playing the leading woman to the great romantic male figures of our time. And always the little mouse, always being put in the position of adoring from afar and then a pat on the head <laughs> if I was a dutiful child. All those, all of them were the suppressed woman that I did play, the put-upon woman. I, I want to talk about some of the, the leading men. You know, I, I guess our vision is, you know, working with everybody's fantasy man, uh, uh, Lawrence Olivier, Cary Grant, Orson Welles, James Stewart, Fred Astaire, Paul Newman. I mean, I could go down the list. Which of those stands out in your mind? Which of them is as magnetic close-up as they were for, on the screen? Well, I don't think actors are magnetic, just to start with. I think women have much stronger personalities. The dynamic women like Betty Davis and uh, Hepburn, to me, are far more of a personality than, than any of the men that I have ever worked with, frankly. Now, I find that men are half ashamed of being actors. A woman's proud. It's a vocation and a profession. A man, to me, always seems a little apologetic about being an actor. Maybe not English actors so much because they're raised in a tradition. But they uh, feel it's accidental and they're along for the ride. But not so the women. They are magnificent fighters, too. Well, some of the stories, though, are of, I mean, how you're meeting these men who, to, to us, look, we talked about, you say that the, the men actors aren't as exciting, but there, it's easier for them to find roles. Obviously, the script writers don't think so. So here you are, week after society. week, you know, month after month, faced with, oh, the most handsome, exciting men in our American minds. I mean, were you in and out of love every week? No, not with an actor, heavens. <laughs> I was married to one, but, oh no, certainly not. None of that. We talk about the actor's craft. What's your feeling now about the Academy Awards? Of course, 
you were an Oscar winner, you were nominated two other times, and yet in your day it seemed like a, much more of a compliment than the carnival we see now, they call the Academy Awards. Well, I wish they didn't call it. I still think it stands for a great deal. And I'm very proud of my Oscar. It is a salute, an accolade from one's peers. And it is a marvelous thing to have had, and I'm very grateful for mine. And I think it is one of the reasons that my career keeps going on and on because I do have that stamp of approval. Yes, that, that does, it does help. It's well, launched it does. many a career. It certainly does. If none of the actors stand out in your mind as having influenced your career, how about the directors? You also worked with the greats. They are men who we view as larger than life. Alfred I learned more, more about acting from George Cukor than from any of the others. More from George Cukor about acting than from any school I'd been to, from Reinhardt or Stanislavski Method or any of those things. Hitchcock was the first to, to bring to the screen and to the cameraman and to the actors, since he had been a set designer, he would draw the effect he wanted. So you would get a marvelous vision of how he wanted his black and white effects. That was very helpful. After that, it was taken up by other directors, and finally, I think, for the um, greatest story ever told, George, uh, George Stevens just had room after room of drawings, almost frame by frame. Up to that point, uh, picture making had been more or less accidental. This, they began the science of uh, directing and photography, but then, and now today, of course, the star of movies is the director. It's a Truffaut, a Bunuel, it's an Antonioni film. It isn't um, anybody particularly anymore. Everybody talks about how you stayed so elegant, so glamorous, and I, sitting, sitting this close, I can say it's true. Should someone grow old gracefully, or should they fight it with every cell in them? Oh, I think growing old a marvelous thing. I mean, who wants to be a rosebud all your life, only when the, this flower is... I am so lucky. Virgil Thompson once said to me, I was 26 years old, John Houseman introduced us, and he looked at me and he said, what a beautiful woman you are going to be. <laughs> and I never forgot that. In other words, it is only with the maturity and the ripening that one is one's potential. Is there kind of a piece, a kind of, oh, I know I did it? Oh, I haven't done it yet. I'm, I've got lots more to do. <laughs> well, good. John Fontaine, I know you've got lots more to do. I and the rest of your audience <laughs> want to see it. Thanks for talking to me. A pleasure.